This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. Each one of us knows someone that has struggled with addiction, whether it's a friend, a classmate, or a family member. Maybe you've battled a type of addiction yourself. But did you ever think about the science behind addiction? Today, Where We Live, we'll talk with a couple of scientists about their research, what they know about addiction, and what they hope future research will discover that may help prevent or treat addiction. Later, we'll check in with a surgeon at St. Mary's Hospital in Waterbury who's looking at treating pain differently in the wake of the opioid overdose crisis. You can join the conversation, comment on our website, wmpr.org slash where we live. You can find us on Facebook and Twitter at where we live. Dr. Mark Potenza is a professor of psychiatry, child study, and neuroscience at the Yale School of Medicine and senior scientist at the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse. He joins us today from the studios of Yale University in New Haven, Connecticut. Hi, Dr. Potenza. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Also on, on the phone right now is Dr. Elisa Chesler, an associate professor at the Jackson Laboratory and principal investigator for its new Center for Systems Neurogenetics of Addiction. Dr. Chesler, welcome to where we live. Hi. Good morning. I'll start with Dr. Potenza. Um, why are some people more susceptible to, addi- to addiction than others? What's the link between genetics and this risk of addiction? There is an important link between genetics and addiction. It's estimated that anywhere from 30 to 70 percent of the liability or risk for addictions is genetic in nature, and this varies somewhat from type of addiction to type of addiction. We asked Dr. Chesler to join us uh, because um, you work at Jackson Laboratory, and we read recently um, that Jackson received an $11.7 million grant from the National Institutes of Health. You know, how will that grant and the creation of this new center advance our understanding of addiction? Well, as Dr. Potenza just said, there's a high heritability of addiction, but we don't necessarily know all of the mechanisms, the biological mechanisms that influence whether or not someone's susceptible. And so the funding that we receive from the NIH allows us to use sophisticated genetics analysis methods and and genomic techniques to start discovering uh, some of those mechanisms that are previously unknown and also to characterize better how the known mechanisms of addiction are working and you're testing on mice, is that right? Uh, yes, yes, we are. Uh, the mouse allows us to look at relationships across many different aspects of addiction, uh, from multiple different behaviors to the underlying biological systems, and it allows us to do this in, in an efficient and, and uh, cost-effective manner. And this is the new center, so, I mean, how many people will be working on this over the course of this five-year grant? Well, it's an exciting model. It's actually a a virtual center in many ways. We have um, a number of different teams from uh, multiple universities in the nation uh, that will be bringing their experimental methods to the Jackson Laboratory. And uh, through the different genetics platforms that we have available, we'll be able to integrate all of their work. And what do you hope will come out of this research? Uh, we're, We're looking for new mechanisms of addiction. We're looking to understand how uh, the uh, early effects of the drug uh, vary in different individuals, um, how impulsivity is related to addiction and other behaviors that predict addiction. Uh, We're looking at how circadian biology influences susceptibility to addiction. And we also want to understand the biology of the habit formation, essentially, and uh, the extent to which that, that habit is malleable or or, uh, reduces in its magnitude when the drug is taken away. And Dr. Potenza, if I could turn to you, can you describe for us um, what happens to a person's brain when he or she becomes addicted to something? How does it change our brain functions? Well, there are many things that we don't know about how the brain changes with addiction. There are differences between individuals with addictions and those without. And there are also individual differences linked to, uh, as was mentioned earlier, to factors that may predispose to addiction, like impulsivity. So individuals with, um, for example, cocaine dependence, uh, we found that they uh, showed different brain activations to either drug-related cues or stress cues as compared to individuals without and that there are important uh, differences, uh, for example, in men and women uh, with respect to the stress-related versus the drug-cue-related brain activations. 
We hear often about dopamine. Can you explain how um, that process, uh, that pleasure seeking that uh, we look for, you know, how that is manipulated when um, we become addicted to a substance? Dopamine is a chemical that has been implicated in uh, many forms of addiction. All drugs of abuse are thought to release dopamine within what's called uh, the mesolimbic pathway. So this is a brain pathway that goes from the midbrain uh, to a structure called the striatum, uh, particularly a structure in the ventral striatum uh, called the nucleus accumbens. And this, for a period of time, um, had been termed the quote-unquote reward center of the brain. Um, it's been implicated in a number of reward-related processes, reward-related learning. Uh, it does many, uh, serves many functions. Um, and one of the areas that uh, has been uncovered over the past uh, decade or, or so is that many people with different forms of addiction tend to show a relatively uh, blunted activation of this brain region uh, to uh, non-drug related rewards like ant anticipating monetary rewards. Individuals with alcohol dependence or with nicotine dependence or with behavioral addictions like pathological gambling or gambling disorder all show blunted activation of this brain region uh, during reward anticipation. And this may be one uh, mechanism uh, that operates across a number of addictions. Uh, Dr. Potenza, you mentioned um, research over the last 10 years. I mean, when did we start to see a shift in how we um, look at uh, the importance of research behind the science of addiction and um, not always putting uh, the blame on the uh, individual because they have become addicted to something? I think I read uh, Dr. Chesler when the grant was announced um, saying that for a long time addiction, you said a long time addiction was seen as strictly a moral failing. So when did that shift begin? I think that this shift has been gradual in nature. I think as we've developed more uh, approaches to understand brain function uh, linked to addiction, uh, for example, with brain imaging that really has advanced over the past 25 years or so, that we've uh, seen a shift in terms of how we perceive addiction that it's seen more as an illness or a disease as compared to a moral failing. Dr. Chester, did you want to add to that why um, society for so long has seen this as a moral failing? I think, you know, it, it's, it's hard to avoid um, um, considering the consequences of drug use, and that's what most people see, and it, it's an unfortunate um, uh, effect on families and communities and it's it's um it really i think relates to our societal view of mental health in general and our emphasis placed on on the treatment of mental health and so as as this changes um i will see an increased um attention on on these issues from from a perspective of of um biology medicine and and treatment and i think that that um it's it's going to be um important to uh, continue to deliver new avenues uh, for effective treatment. Uh, I think the hopelessness of the situation for many years has led people to um, uh, view it as, as a, a frustrating and, and moral issue. And so that research that Jackson Laboratory is, um, has started, that will hopefully address that stigma that you mentioned? Um, I think in in one way it does, and it's it's really um, when we when we do look at mouse genetics and we see strain differences, different different breeds of mice essentially showing different different behaviors and different sensitivities to addiction. Uh, it, we it's hard to um, think about that as a a moral failure of the laboratory mouse um, that we 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 can't blame the mice uh, for for. Um, uh, uh, in, in taking more drug, um, there we think of biological differences. Mm -hmm. And if we can extrapolate that to the human population, uh, to ourselves, I think we can we can gain some insight. And all this is beyond the biological discoveries that we think can lead to therapeutic interventions. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Today we're talking about the science of addiction. On the phone with me is Dr. Alyssa Chesler, Associate Professor at the Jackson Laboratory and Principal Investigator for its new Center for Systems Neurogenetics of Addiction. 
Also joining us from Yale University Studios is Dr. Mark Potenza, Professor of Psychiatry, Child Study, and Neuroscience at the Yale School of Medicine, also Senior Scientist at the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse. We're getting a uh, tweet from a listener uh, who writes, Factor in a society that represses all emotions, advertises pills for everything, and docs who treat only symptoms. What do you think about that tweet, Dr. Potenza? Well, I think a, a mainstay of uh, addictions uh, involves behavioral therapies, and some of the best treatments for addictions are behavioral therapies like cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, there are non-professional uh, self-help groups that are very helpful for people like Alcoholics Anonymous uh, as well as other 12-step programs. I do think that... Um, I'm hopeful that uh, medications will be um, uh, helpful for a larger number of people. There are some medications that are very helpful, uh, but I think we do have to think about um, uh, all the avenues of treatment to help people with addictions. And Dr. Potenza, remind us of what some of the um, medications that are out there today that help people um, who are struggling with addiction. There are several medications that have FDA approvals for the treatments of different forms of addiction. Uh, some work by blocking opioid receptors, so medications like naltrexone uh, have FDA indications for alcohol dependence as well as for opioid dependence, and also seems to be helpful for a broader range of addictions. So there have been several placebo-controlled trials that have found naltrexone to be superior to placebo in the treatment of pathological gambling or gambling disorder. And there are other medications. A camprosate uh, has FDA approval for the treatment of alcohol dependence. Uh, disulfiram, which is also known as antabuse, uh, is uh, FDA indicated for uh, alcohol dependence. And Dr. Alyssa Chesler, uh, before we go to break, again, um, anything else you want to talk, say about this grant and this, this new uh, five-year initiative of the Jackson Laboratory to really look at the science behind addiction? Well, I think, I think it's um, going to be important for us to understand how, how the risk for addiction is related to um, the behavioral changes that occur uh, with addiction and the recovery from addiction. So, um, you know, as Dr. Potenza mentioned, not only do we look for biological therapeutics, but also how behavioral change occurs and what the mechanisms of forming new habits might be. Do you anticipate that your research uh, could change how doctors prescribe um, painkillers in the future? Uh, I think that's a very long-term consequence. When we think about basic science, even when it's close to clinical issues, we still have a long way to go before the deliverable from that basic science actually finds its way into the clinic. There's a, there's a lot of work to be done. And so we want to simultaneously work at all levels of science. Well, I want to thank Dr. Elissa Chesler, Associate Professor at the Jackson Laboratory and Principal Investigator for its new Center for Systems Neurogenetics of Addiction. Thank you for your time, Dr. Chesler. Thank you. When we return, we'll continue our conversation with Dr. Mark Potenza. We'll take your phone calls, your tweets. Today, we're talking about the science of addiction. Addiction is a disease, but why do we continue to judge people who are struggling because of it? Comment on our website, wmpr.org slash where we live. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Today we're talking with researchers to learn why some of us are more susceptible to addiction than others. Dr. Mark Potenza is with me from the studios of Yale University of New Haven to help us better understand the biology of addiction. And coming up later, we'll talk to a Waterbury surgeon about his role in helping to curb Connecticut's opioid crisis. You can join the conversation. Have you dealt with addiction or know someone who has? Do you have a question for Dr. Potenza? And I want to take a call now. Uh, Mary is calling. Uh, Mary, you're on where we live. Hello. Um, I just wanted to talk about my my personal experiences with addictions, um, of which I have had several. Currently, I have two addictions. One of them is to nicotine. The other one is to gambling, and they're they they both feel very very different. When I try to stop smoking. I get really physical, physical withdrawal 
symptom. Um, I, I am uh, almost up fetally in bed, uh, crying, etc. Uh, with gambling, it's more of a brain thing. And um, I can only describe it as my brain has this almost like the female component of a lock and the gambling experience is the is the male component it's the key mm. that fits into that female component in my brain and something goes click and i get pleasure from it and i had a friend who said to me that just don't understand how I can spend hours doing that. And my response was, it is the only place that I go where all my pain goes away. That's interesting. I'm glad that you called, Mary, because I wanted to ask Dr. Potenza about the different types of addiction. Did you first want to um, talk to Mary about you know, how she sees her nicotine addiction and her gambling addiction as, as different, uh, Dr. Potenza? Yes, I, I'm very interested in hearing more about that. Uh, I also uh, want to point out that these two conditions often are found together. And it's interesting to hear how they're experienced and experienced differently. The tobacco or the, the nicotine, uh, when one is trying to quit smoking, uh, one often encounters uh, significant withdrawal symptoms from uh, the absence of the drug. And uh, mood changes are often seen uh, during uh, acute nicotine or tobacco withdrawal. With respect to the gambling, uh, it's not unusual for people to experience um, a loss of uh, pain. We found uh, elevated rates of problem gambling with people who experience chronic pain. And there are often uh, positive things that people uh, get out of um, some of the behaviors that become addictive. And trying to work to look at uh, the, the negative impact of the addiction as well as the positive during the recovery uh, period because oftentimes it's giving up something to which there are some uh, pleasurable uh, or positive uh, associations. But if the uh, gambling, for example, becomes excessive and interferes in major areas of life functioning, then it's important to try to find uh, alternative ways of experiencing pleasure or uh, perhaps in uh, Mary's case, uh, relieving uh, pain or discomfort. I thought it was interesting also, Dr. Potenza, you know, she said that a friend of hers asked her, how can you sit there for hours and, and, and gamble? Um, just interesting that the judgment of people just think you can just, you know, stop that behavior um, and they question, you know, why, why can't you just do that? Correct. I think it's sometimes difficult for people um, who have not experienced, uh, for example, gambling problems to understand uh, people with gambling problems. However, I think that the good news in Connecticut is that there are treatment options available for people and there are counselors uh, throughout the state of Connecticut uh, who are available who can uh, help people uh, during the recovery process and uh, help promote recovery. So there's uh, Problem Gambling Services of uh, Connecticut uh, that has satellite uh, services uh, throughout the state of Connecticut. Uh, Rick is calling from South Windsor. Rick, you're on Where We Live. Hi, thanks for taking my call. Uh, so I had a question. As a lay person, it kind of seems ironic to me that the state has spent billions of dollars trying to prevent opioid addiction to stop while at the same time, this big push to completely legalize marijuana recreation. I just wonder, is there any connection? Do you see a connection there? Um, is there any chance that marijuana use could lead to opioid addiction, or how does that strike you? 
All right, Rick, thank you for that question. Uh, Dr. Potenza, I, I don't know if you could hear him. The phone line was a little difficult, but he was saying, is there a, a link between, you know, is marijuana really a gateway drug to other um, addiction to other substances? I think that's a good question, and I think that's part of the societal uh, dialogue and debate about uh, legalization of cannabis or marijuana. And in some ways, we don't fully know the answer. There are risks associated with uh, cannabis or marijuana. Some people develop uh, psychotic uh, features uh, after taking cannabis, for example. Uh, and understanding these individual differences, we don't fully understand the factors that uh, relate to how uh, one person or another may respond to a, a drug. I think from a societal perspective, if we are uh, making a drug legal, there are some people who may feel that it's safer if it's legalized, but it may still carry risks, and the extent to which it may lead into other uh, substances is something that, as different jurisdictions legalize marijuana, that I hope that they're collecting the data and that we can understand this better. Speaking of, um, you know, just research, I know you've been doing um, studying addiction for some time, and I'm curious between um, adolescence and the adult brain. You know, what can you, we can what can you tell us about? You know, is it um, when we think about marijuana and recreational use? Um, oftentimes, we hear the you know zero tolerance among you know young people. Um, but when if they're using, say, marijuana um, as adolescents, does that make them more at risk to develop other addictions as they become adults? Can you talk about what happens to the brain? Well, I think the we're still understanding what happens to the brain during normal development, quote-unquote normal development, as well as how substance use may impact brain development. So during the time from childhood to uh, especially through young adulthood, uh, there are many changes that are uh, going on inside the brain. Uh, some of that involves um, changes in white matter and gray matter. Uh, but also in the, the ways in which the neurons are connected. And adolescents, um, people have hypothesized that some of the brain structures that are involved in pro-motivational behaviors, so the drive to engage in behaviors, uh, mature more rapidly than some of the brain structures that are involved in self-control or emotional regulation, particularly the frontal cortex. And people have hypothesized that this uh, relative imbalance, if, if you will, uh, may predispose adolescents to engage in risky behaviors, uh, including substance use. Then, as you mentioned, substance use may impact brain development. And drugs um, each have their own impact on uh, how the brain uh, functions. For example, uh, alcohol is thought to be particularly harmful to uh, white matter tracts. So individuals with alcohol uh, dependence show uh, marked differences in the way in which uh, the brain is you know, connected. So one can think about uh, the potential impact that substances may have on adolescent development. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. That's Dr. Mark Potenza, professor of psychiatry, child study, and neuroscience at the Yale School of Medicine and senior scientist at the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse. I wanted to bring Dave from Berlin into the conversation. Dave, you're on Where We Live. What's your question or comment? I, I just want to I appreciate what you're doing today. It's kind of interesting to me, but I'm an employer, and I've had some people in my family with addiction issues. So I've made a lot of effort to try and, you know, help addicted people out. Putting them in, It's in the construction industry, and that kind of attracts uh, people who are, you know, addicted. And so what happens in my experience is I put all these effort into training these people. They, they appear initially like they're going to work out fine, and then I've got two months of training, and I'm finally getting two or three months of work, and then it starts with, you know, they're late on a Monday, they leave early on a Friday, they ask you on a Wednesday for a $40 advance on their pay. 
And what really happens is we put all these effort into people, and then they fall off the wagon, and then, you know, you, you try and keep them around, they get back on the wagon, and they're off. It's constantly a disruption, and I think the biggest issue is either these people aren't getting treated long enough so that they can, you know, get to the point where they can stay on the wagon for a long enough period of time or they're replacing drugs with alcohol. I mean, it's just very frustrating from somebody who's trying to help somebody get back into, you know, the mainstream of life and just put all this effort into it and have it all just go up in flames after. And believe me, the downfall from the time the symptoms of they're getting off the wagon to the time they're completely, you know, of no use to me in my business is like two weeks mm. from up, starting to fall off to gone. You know, and that really frustrates those of us who are trying to help people. Well, thank you. I don't know what your response is to that. Well, thank you, Dave, for your call. Anyway, it's interesting that you bring that up, Dave, because we're, you know, we think often about the consequences personally when we know someone or love someone who is addicted, but the societal consequences of addiction. Dr. Potenza, can you um, have any reaction to um, what Dave was saying about, you know, trying to help people, but oftentimes um, it's with uh, to no avail? I do have some thoughts. First of all, I'd like to applaud Dave for his efforts to try to help people and to integrate people with addictions uh, more fully into the workplace. And I also want to acknowledge the frustration that um, people encounter uh, interacting with people with addictions, that they may often engender uh, such a frustration. Uh, part of that is part of the illness that uh, one may think of addiction as a uh, disease of in involving uh, decision making where uh, people make disadvantageous choices. Uh, they may use drugs over going to work and for an employer that would uh, be very frustrating. I think another point that was raised uh, was about uh, treatment and availability and duration of treatment. And I would advocate for um, more treatment and better treatment, and we're working to try to understand how best to help people with addictions. And I think that the, the research will help with respect to optimizing treatments. I want to take another call. Speaking of, of treatment, uh, Mark from East Hampton. Mark, you're on Where We Live. Hi. Um, I just had a question. If you guys, you know, were any aware of uh, how the state legislator has changed recently um, to kind of cut funding for a lot of these kind of treatment programs and research um, facilities. I firsthand work with people that deal with addiction, and since I've seen these kind of cuts, I've noticed that um, I see a lot of people coming in and out of therapy that, you know, like our previous caller was saying, just don't seem to be getting the right kind of help or long enough help. And, um, you know, a lot of them talk about funding, and it coincides with, you know, what I think, because the state has cut the funding, these people are suffering, and they're not able to get what they need. And I, I just feel that, um, you know, it's, it's kind of an injustice. You know, some people can't help these kind of addictions. They don't know where to go, and they finally get it, but they can't follow all the way through. So I just wanted to know your thoughts on how, you know, the funding has been cut and how maybe you have seen how it's affected your line of work with uh, treating addiction. Thank you, Mark, for your call. Um, obviously, an important point uh, with uh, the budget uh, crisis that uh, the state of Connecticut is dealing with and cutting uh, social services to people who need it. Dr. Potenza, can you talk at all about you know the, what kind of treatment is out there and when if someone doesn't have insurance, I mean, what are they left if, if there's no safety net? Well, I do share the concern of budget cuts, and I think it is important to maintain uh, services for people and that uh, it's an area that we uh, contend with on a regular basis. It, um, I do think that there are uh, services that uh, still exist. Um, there are state uh, services, but I do believe that the state facilities are, as was mentioned, with respect to the uh, budgetary uh, cutbacks, that we um, that that's something that we need to be mindful of as a society that it's an important investment to um, have these treatment services be available. 
you know, what does it take for someone who's been struggling with addiction um, to get better, to not feel like they, you know, there's no way out of, of this constant need for a particular substance um, to get through um, every day? I mean, I've heard um, th- even through my reporting in the past that oftentimes, you know, you need a 30-day program um, where um, you're away from the environment um, that you were in when you were addicted. Um, but what are the, I guess, the the approved ways of, t- of recovering? Like, what are some ways that people can, where do they go to get help and what works? What has been proven to work? Well, there are many different interventions that have been shown to be helpful. Unfortunately, at this point in time, we don't have a, a, a good way to match people uh, with precise programs. So, for example, people may have heard of people uh, who have given up smoking by crumpling the last pack of cigarettes and tossing it away and then not smoking. Um, However, more people tend to struggle with giving up uh, smoking, as our our first caller, Mary, uh, seemed to indicate. There are multiple behavioral therapies that have been found to be helpful, cognitive behavioral therapy, where uh, individuals learn different strategies for, for, for example, coping with craving, uh, these urges that people uh, encounter uh, to use substances or engage in addictive behaviors. There are other forms of treatment uh, that um, contingency management is uh, an approach that uh, has been shown to be helpful. It's essentially um, during the acute period of abstinence, people receive um, amounts of money for uh, drug-free urines um, or other aspects of uh, engaging in treatment. And that's shown to be helpful in the short term, but perhaps not as robustly effective as cognitive behavioral therapy, which is more effective in the long term. And it's thought that cognitive behavioral therapy, by giving people uh, skills uh, with respect to uh, handling different emotional states as well as uh, making better decisions, uh, long-term decisions, that this is something that is um, more robust and durable. There are also, as was mentioned, uh, some uh, pharmacotherapies, some medications that are helpful for addictions. And we are still trying to understand uh, what combinations will work well with uh, specific individuals. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. We're talking about the science of addiction. I want to take a call now. Bill from Middletown. Bill, you're on where we live. Yes, hi. Um, I uh, am a retired uh, substance abuse counselor. And uh, in my 20 years of experience, I found a couple of things to be true. One of them is that... uh, Educating people about their disease is crucial, um, and and letting them know that they don't necessarily have a moral failing, but they um, have a disease. One of the things that I used to teach is that alcoholics and addicts break down drugs and alcohol differently in the brain than non-alcoholics or addicts do, and they experience more pleasure than the non-addict or alcoholic does. And and when I realized that myself. Uh, because I'm in recovery, that was a crucial turning point for me. And I remembered that I was always the one who wanted to do more. And no other people, well, no, and I wondered why. Um, the other thing, too, in, uh, the, in the success seems to be tied in with what happens after the person gets their initial sobriety. A job is so important, something to do long-term, um, without that, um, most people I've seen fail. So anyway, that's my uh, comment. Thank you. Thank you, Bill, uh, for your call. Um, I wanted to turn back to Dr. Potenza. You know, you, obviously you've been studying addiction for some time. Uh, you know, millions of dollars are being thrown at um, ways to help people in this opioid overdose crisis. Uh, but you've been studying many different types of addiction. I mean, what do you feel is, um, you know, successful um, when we look at trying to get people on the road to recovery? Well, I think that, uh, as was mentioned uh, by our prior caller, uh, education is helpful. Um, also, uh, structure. 
Uh, our prior caller mentioned uh, having a, a job, but I would say while that is very important, people can find daily structure um, in other activities, including through 12-step uh, uh, programs. I think that um, integrating people uh, more fully into society is very helpful. Uh, addictions take a substantial toll uh, not only on the individual but on society. They're estimated to be uh, amongst the most costly uh, conditions to society, estimated uh, costing uh, in the United States um, over $500 billion annually. And this, this estimate includes things like lost wages uh, due to uh, missing work. Uh, as has been mentioned. So this, this idea that I think Dave had brought up uh, earlier about uh, trying to help people um, integrate into work is very important, and that resonates with what our prior caller uh, was mentioning. This is Where We Live. I'm Lucy Nalbethanchel. Today we're talking about addiction. Lately, the disease is discussed in the context of the number of people dying from opioid and heroin overdoses in the U.S. When we come back, we'll speak with a surgeon who's helping change how he and his colleagues prescribe painkillers after surgery. If you're waiting to uh, speak to our guests, uh, please stay with us. This is Where We Live. This is where we live. I'm Lucy Nalbathanchel. Today, we've been discussing the biology of addiction, including why some people are more susceptible to addiction than others. With that in mind, a Waterbury surgeon is joining us now to talk about a new approach to treating patients post-surgery. Dr. Philip Corvo is chairman of the Department of Surgery and director of surgical critical care at St. Mary's Hospital in Waterbury. He's also the founder and president at the Connecticut Surgical Quality Collaborative. Dr. Corvo, welcome to where we live. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. So we've um, heard that you've led efforts at St. Mary's to offer opioid sparing surgery. Can you tell us about it? Yes, absolutely. Um, when people have surgery, one of the biggest things that they are worried about is what kind of pain they're going to go through. And for decades, we have had uh, narcotic-based pain medication available to us. Uh, it's only been the last several years that we have had alternatives available that work just as well without the side effects without the uh, addiction potential. Um, and as time has gone by, we've learned more and more about how to use these alternative medicines in various combinations, and we have literally gotten to the point where we can do major abdominal and joint surgery and have people leave the hospital with absolutely no narcotic, no opioid pain medication at all. When we're talking about uh, opioid and narcotics, uh, tell us about what some of the standard painkillers are that people are prescribed after surgery, um, and then what are some of these alternatives? Sure. Um, it, when people are in the hospital, usually we use uh, intravenous versions of medications. They work faster than, than the pill versions, uh, and after certain surgeries, the absorption uh, capability of people's intestines is very variable. So if we give a pill, we, we just don't know what people have absorbed and, and literally what's still sitting in their intestinal tract. So the intravenous uh, versions that we usually talk about are things like morphine and Demerol and fentanyl. Um, and then when people are, are home, uh, if they still need something for pain, we choose to give them pill versions of things. Uh, so people have heard about uh, a mixture of codeine and Tylenol um, people have heard about Percocet, Lortab, Vicodin. Uh, those are usually combinations of a, of a narcotic pain medicine and, and something like Tylenol. So the alternatives are uh, newer engineered versions of, of medications that people are already familiar with. Uh, probably the first one that came on the market years ago was something called Toradol. Uh, the easiest way to think about that is an intravenous very potent version of Motrin. A um, couple of years uh, after that, uh, another drug came on the market. Think of it as an intravenous version of Tylenol. Technically, it's uh, uh, intravenous acetaminophen, something called Ofremev. Um, when, when you say Tylenol, people sort of poo-poo it and think, oh, I just had major surgery. There's no way you can give me Tylenol. Um, but when you take a pill of Tylenol, your, your liver 
metabolizes almost 90% of it and makes you get rid of it. So only a tenth of that tablet is left available to work on your pain receptors. When we give you the intravenous version of it, 100% of it is available for pain control. So think of this intravenous version as being 10 times more potent than regular Tylenol is. It's as potent as morphine and Demerol is without the, the side effects and without the addiction potential. Uh, and most recently, we started using uh, a medication called Exparel. I think a lot of people are uh, used to the idea of going to the dentist and having some dental work and getting an injection of Novocaine that lasts for six hours. Uh, picture a local anesthetic injection that we can give during the time of surgery that lasts up to three or four days. Uh, so between combination of those medicines, we were able to do major surgeries on people, give them those medicines instead of narcotics, and people go home. Uh, if they don't take narcotics in the first place, their chances of ever getting addicted is, mm -hmm. is almost zero. Um, I think you said that these alternatives have been around for a while, so why haven't they been prescribed more readily? I, I think the reason is that in the past we've focused on one single medicine, and that one medicine has... Uh, decreased our use of narcotic, but what we were doing was giving uh, one of these alternatives along with some narcotics anyway. Um, but now that we've got enough alternatives together, we've, we've come up with these um, mixtures of all of these alternatives and literally just left the narcotics off on the side. And what is the uh, insurance company, what do they think about uh, these alternatives? Um, it, it seems to be a mixed reaction. Um, it's very easy for uh, insurance companies and, and hospitals, and, and I've, I've seen this myself at my own hospital, uh, it's very easy for people to focus on the cost of what's happening right now. Uh, everybody has to worry about their budget cycles over the end of the week and the month, et cetera. Uh, so these medications do tend to be more expensive than the narcotics that we've been using for decades that are, that are all generic now. Um, but if you... If you force people to step back and look at the bigger picture, uh, from a financial standpoint, they all make perfect sense. Uh, classically, somebody who has a colon surgery, um, I'm a, a general surgeon by training, so I operate mostly in the abdomen. So if I do a colon surgery on someone, the average length of stay in a hospital is five or seven days, and then they go home. Um, a large portion of that time in the hospital is spent because the patient's intestine simply hasn't woken up from the surgery, um, and one of the, the side effects of the narcotics is to create something we call an ileus, and basically the, the intestine stays paralyzed. Um, but by not giving people narcotics at all, they go home in two days or three days. Uh, so now when you point this out to the hospitals, the, the people who are running the budgets understand better that it's, it's better to spend the money a little bit, a little bit more up front so that uh, on the back end of it, uh, you know, it makes sense financially. And the insurance companies, I think, are just starting to, to come around and appreciate that. I want to take a quick call. Uh, Bob from Waterbury, you're on Where We Live. We just have a couple of minutes left, if you could be quick. Sure. Um, I think a big part of the problem is that this is a perfect storm. You've got the insurance industry, you've got the pharmaceutical industry, and you've got the medical profession. Um, on, on the medical profession aspect, when you consider that Earlier and earlier, young people are starting, uh, people are starting opiate use as far as abuse goes at a younger and younger age. Um, the later statistics uh, reflect that this is looking more and more like a, a disease of childhood when you look at the age of onset, which is particularly despicable. When you add to that that this, nobody starts on heroin. Okay. Primarily, people start abusing opiates with prescription opiates. And the reason that these prescription opiates are available at all for abuse is because of medical professionals who don't follow best practice and there's not monitoring of the medical profession. With respect to a professional organization like the medical profession, the most respected profession in our society, it's a, it, it just... It's mind-boggling that this profession is abdicating its responsibility in the role of this man-made, professional-made epidemic. All right. Well, Bob, thank you for your comment. I'll have uh, Dr. Corvo respond, and then I wanted to just ask a quick question to Dr. Potenza. Dr. Corvo? 
Yes, um, <clears throat> I understand where, where Bob is coming from. Um, I, I will disagree that we are, are not monitored. Uh, we are heavily monitored um, and need to answer to societies and the uh, regulatory bodies if we're, if we're doing something that's inappropriate. Um, and, and I think the program that I have just described, uh, which literally is at a, a statewide level through the Connecticut Surgical Quality Collaborative, um, demonstrates that we have not abrogated our responsibility to, to prevent this. Uh, and, and please understand that by doing a surgery and not giving any narcotic to somebody, we are preventing that individual from becoming an addict in the first place. So we don't, if, if somebody's not becoming an addict, we don't have to worry about recovery. We don't have to worry about treatment. We don't have to worry about repeat uh, emergency room episodes uh, where they're receiving Narcan, uh, et cetera. So it's, we, we are attacking it on a totally different front. And then, Dr. Mark Potenza, I just wanted to go back to you before uh, we end. You know, for people who have addiction in their family um, and they may have to get surgery, I mean, what, are, what is some advice uh, to, our, to our listeners who may become patients, and how should they um, respond um, when they're offered painkillers uh, to, to be rid of the pain? Well, I, I think it's very helpful to hear of the non-narcotic alternatives that currently exist for managing pain. And uh, I would encourage them to look into these options and to open a dialogue with their, uh, with their physician about these options. And Dr. Corvo, you're at St. Mary's Hospital. What are some other hospitals that are looking at opioid sparing surgery? I said before, this is actually a, a statewide initiative. The Connecticut Surgical Quality Collaborative uh, is... Uh, all 28 acute care hospitals in the state, uh, we are all in various stages of developing something called enhanced recovery after surgery protocols, uh, and a, a large portion of those protocols is uh, opioid sparing techniques, um, improved nutrition after surgery to get people out of the hospital sooner, faster, safer, stronger. Um, literally every hospital in the state is doing it. This collaborative is uh, unique. It's probably the only type of its kind in the world because we do realize what the we do realize the magnitude of the problem that we have in Connecticut with with uh, narcotic addiction. And then, real quick, Doctor um, Doctor Corvo, you know how have the the potency of narcotics changed over the years? The way it's formulated is it a lot stronger than it used to be? Uh, I th I think the uh, formulations are stronger. I think the dosages uh, dosages have uh, have increased. Um, a lot of that has to do with the fact that we are able to do uh, much larger surgeries than we were able to do before, uh, and unfortunately that tends to create more pain. Um, we also have this uh, societal feeling, um, and, and I do understand where this is coming from, that you know people should never experience any discomfort at all, so we have this pressure to uh, prescribe uh, more potent, faster-acting, longer-acting uh, pain medicine and we're creating a, a brand new problem by doing that. Dr. Philip Corvo, Chairman of the Department of Surgery and Director of Surgical Critical Care at St. Mary's Hospital in Waterbury. Thank you, Dr. Corvo, for your time. Thank you. My pleasure. Also, Dr. Mark Potenza, Professor of Psychiatry, Child Study, and Neuroscience at the Yale School of Medicine and Senior Scientist at the National Center on Addiction and Substance Abuse. Thank you, Dr. Potenza, for your time this hour. Thank you. Our show is produced by Lydia Brown and Jeff Tyson. Our technical producer is Kion Wolf. WNPR's executive producer is Katie Tularski. Thank you for all your calls and questions. You can continue the conversation on our website, wmpr.org slash where we live. I'm Lucy Nalpathanchel. Thanks for listening.